it doesn't matter how much you think you can tolerate low sleep, the likelihood of you having the gene mutation that permits you to function at less than seven hours sleep is the same likelihood as you being hit by lightning twice. <laughs> so you, you almost definitely don't have it, right? Um, so focusing on sleep has been a big red pill that everybody can do. It's free. Like it's the most free thing that you can <laughs> that you can do and you can start it tonight. Um, Joe Rogan episode number 1109 with Matthew Walker was the turning point for me and I know it was for a lot of other people as well listening to that. Hey Chris, thank you for coming on man. Welcome to the Rewind Talks. Thanks man. Pleasure to be here. I want to get to know the Chris before he started the successful podcast Modern Wisdom which has like 2.5 million downloads now. I believe congrats. I know you had this uh, event planning company. You're really into the party scene. And I could see, really see a lot of university students like myself resonating with this old Chris. So how is he like? Yeah, I guess I was a very normal university student from the northeast of the UK, working class background. Um, came to uni and didn't really have much of an identity, didn't have much of a sense of self. like. You're just this creature that your parents have kind of formed and maybe you've got some friends, but you've never really had to look after yourself or do anything. And then you mm. arrive at uni and you're like, okay, how do I cook pasta, wash my pants, <laughs> like organize a schedule, wake up on time, like all that stuff. So I became a club promoter, as a lot of people do. Newcastle's got a big nightlife scene. Um, I was quite talented at it and very quickly wrapped my sense of identity around that. Um, I wasn't a full-blown party boy because I always liked the idea of being a businessman and an entrepreneur as well. But there was a big party element in there too. So just classic drinking, like uni drinking style. Got me through. I did a placement year for myself. Um, I lied to my placement tutor. Me and my business partner lied to our placement tutor and we awarded ourselves placement students of the year by writing our own reference. Um, so out of all of the different people that had gone and done placements, we worked for ourselves, wrote our own reference and got an award for it, which is kind of funny. Then I stayed at Newcastle and did a master's in international marketing. So it was just, it was a long time at uni, right? And, um, during that time, I wasn't really that bothered about growth. Um, or perhaps I wasn't explicitly bothered about growth and development and making myself better. I was just kind of involved with novelty. There was new things to do and adventure and, and mistakes to make and, to learn from uh, or not learn from sometimes and <laughs> that was it man like it was a very very typical university experience and that's why i like talking to young guys now about where they're at i've been with the same business partner for the last 14 years we sat next to each other at our first seminar and now we're still together i've literally just got back from his house there um and we've coached or uh, employed over a thousand students probably wow. be like 2000 now um i'll have worked one-on-one -on -one closely with maybe a hundred managers so guys that have been in my pocket that have had my phone number that i've dealt with on a daily basis and i see certain patterns in behavior in thinking in worldview in routine in the way they deal with relationships and and good times and bad times and all this sort of stuff and it's a fascinating perspective to view human nature from and that's informed a lot of the way that i think uh and yeah i, I enjoy making them better man i get these i get these 18 year old rough hewn rocks and i <laughs> shine them and i shine them and i shine them and then they they leave three years later and they're these absolute beasts like ready to go take over the world and they go work for Goldman Sachs or they go start their own business or they go like be an amazing dad or brother or whatever. And I, I really enjoy that process. And hopefully with my podcast, which is what a lot of my passion goes into now, I'm doing the same thing, but at scale to the internet rather than to people that work for me. Hmm. I really went down sort of a similar path, but I started in high school. I was 16. I was also a club promoter. I would like rent out clubs. I would do these huge events in, uh, in Miami. And I very quickly, like after a couple of years, I very quickly started realizing that it was not fulfilling. And I didn't think I didn't want to scale in that industry because staying up too late, drinking too much, I didn't like that lifestyle i thought i did a lot of people might think okay you're 
getting with a bunch of girls, you're going out partying, you're having fun, and that's success. But I very quickly realized that that was not success for me. Did you have a similar realization as to why you started doing the podcast, reading a lot, and really getting into this growth work? Or how was your story like? Yeah. Um, uh, first off, I'm impressed that you managed to have that level of uh, sort of self-awareness at such a young age. It took me until I was 27 to even realize that it was a bit of a problem. So I'd put nearly a decade in of the same industry without even really fact-checking myself around, is this what I want to be doing? Is this how I should be doing what I'm doing? So yes, it's it's difficult, man. You, you said um, like to other people that might look like success or fun, but that's their definition of success or fun. And the main problem I see with young guys and girls, but I can't speak for girls, you know, I never was one. <laughs> um, the main problem that I see with the young guys that come and work for me is that they do what they think other people want them to do. Hmm. So their sense of self-worth, their sense of success, what they should be achieving in life is all just societal norm or what their parents might have wanted them to do. Like people arriving at university doing a degree because that's what their parents expect of them. Like mm -hmm. what like is this is this the 1800s? What's going on? So <laughs> yeah, for me the the turning point I went on a I've been on a few reality TV shows. Um the most recent one was Love Island. While I was on there, I realized because I was around people who were that super extroverted club promoter, big dick around town party boy <laughs> that I thought I was, I was like oh, hang on a second, I'm actually, I've got nothing in common with these guys. I felt very alone in a villa surrounded by people because I'd been playing this persona for a very, very, very long time and I hadn't worked out who I was. So that was a problem. Problem required solution. And the solution was do some self-inquiry, do lots of self-inquiry, spend a lot of time looking at mindful content, reading, listening, watching. It was 2015. 15. So that was like peak Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Rogan come up. Like that was really as they burst onto the scene. So it was a good time for me. Um, I think I would have been the absolute perfect epitome of what those guys were trying to, who they were aiming that red pill at. Um, mm. And it landed sort of straight in my mouth. And it took a very, very, very long time, but I've managed to get myself to a place where I'm much more aligned with what I truly want. I understand what I truly want. I know why I'm here. I know my values. Um, and from that, I can utilize whatever talents I do have to be able to hopefully help other people. Like I'm not perfect, but I got mm. a pretty good idea of where I was and where I am and how I got here. And even just being able to give someone 10%, 1% of that, is it makes such a difference because a little snowball causes an avalanche in people's lives when they start to see just how they can behave differently. So yes, that was it, man. Spent a bit of time on reality TV and got catapulted towards a life of virtue, which is <laughs> probably not what most people go on reality TV for, but no, it worked for me. So you talk about this red pill and it included meditating, reading, all those things, but what impediments did you find that didn't allow you to follow sort of this newly found path of yours oh god man everything everything like your ingrained behavior mechanisms even the thought patterns you have like you might want to do a thing but the thing that you do gets framed within your existing mental models so you have mental models are basically how you perceive the world you don't see what's happening you see what your brain thinks you should perceive as happening so you're always one level removed from what's going on, right? This is why when you take psychedelics and the default mode network gets shut off, that you see things in different ways and you make connections in, in uh, areas that you don't usually. Um, but that, especially if you've got a, a slightly introspective, self-referential, self-inquiry monologue going on and you're always talking to yourself, which I am or was and am, it means that you can end up really ingraining these thought patterns. And that was the first thing to get over. The first thing to get over was like, God, like, how do I even think about the world? I didn't know how to think. I didn't know what a cognitive bias was. I didn't know what, I didn't know what a mental model was. I didn't even know that I didn't get to see the world. So it was 
a long, long process of deprogramming. I talk a lot about intentionality and living a consciously designed life. And what I mean by this is programming your desires so that you want what you want to want, not wanting what you used to want when you were 15 or wanting what your parents want you to want or wanting what your society or culture or friends want you to want or your paths of least resistance or your genetic predisposition or the way you've dealt with a past trauma. Like all of that stuff contributes to who you are but it shouldn't define the the way that you move forward. And for me, like going, okay, I'm confused. I thought I was this party boy um, and I'm not. So who am I? Like like genuinely, what, what am I interested in? Why am I here? And it took a lot of exposure to people who were speaking a language that I understood. And I'm like, oh, wow, Alanda Botton from the School of Life. Fuck, like this guy talks in a way... That, that feels like he's talking to me. So I just consume everything that he made. Jordan Peterson, wow, that guy feels like he's talking to me. Oh my God, I need to tell the truth. I can't even tell the truth. I don't know what my own truth is because I've played this persona for so long that I, I can't even understand. And then when I started doing my podcast, I, that got supercharged because I'm forced to rigorously assess my own thinking in real time against people like Robert Greene or James Clear or Aubrey Marcus. Aubrey Marcus telling me about how the persona can never receive love. It can only receive praise because people don't love Russell Crowe. They love Gladiator. People don't love Chris Hemsworth. They love Thor. And I was like, that was me. I was playing a persona for so long and that's why I never felt love. I only felt praise. I'd go do something good, but because it wasn't truly me that was doing the, the good thing, it just felt like the, the guy that I was playing, the role I was playing was was what was being praised. Um, but for every single one of those insights, you need to put in like a hundred hours of thinking and ruminating and getting it wrong and ignoring it. And maybe you come across it five times and it's only on the sixth time that it finally lands with you. So sadly, sadly, I, I don't think that there is a fast track for self-development and for personal growth. The fastest track would be to never have the programming in the first place. I'm not a dad yet, and but I can't wait to be one. Uh, and my goal is to make my kids just as completely aligned as they want to be. You know, like, what is it that you truly want to do? I'm not going to force you to do anything. I'm going to give you the tools to be able to be amazing at whatever it is that you want to do. And I think that that's like where... I'm trying to get myself to now, you know, so I don't feel obliged to be the person I was yesterday or the person I thought I should be tomorrow. I'm just present, awakened. Trying to find your true self. And as you say, it could be really hard with all the social constructs that we do have. And you mentioned psychedelics. I'm curious to know what other tools did you use to sort of break down this social constructs that we all have because of our culture, our family, our parents, et cetera? Uh, psychedelics haven't been a part of it. Um, mm. I've, I've used them. I mean, I'm really experienced with drugs, but I'm experienced <laughs> in a, a party setting rather than in a, uh, a, a self-development setting. Being honest, man, meditation has been fantastic for me, but I don't think the type of meditation I've been doing, which has mostly been uh, Vipassana mindfulness meditation, I don't think that that's fantastic at helping you to see the truth. I think it just helps you to see and control emotions a little bit more effectively. It gives you, it stops you from being attached to your thoughts, right? A thought arises in consciousness and you no longer attach yourself to it, which is great for controlling emotions and, and staying calm and mindful. Um, but I don't necessarily, that, that may be a good foundation, but it doesn't necessarily give you a good idea of the direction that you need to go in. Um, and for a lot of that, it was me finding my role models, the Petersons of the world, the Rogans of the world, the Alanda Bottons, the Sam Harrises, and then taking bits from all over the place, you know, someone that you wouldn't never even think of, like the, the lady that wrote the tattooist of Auschwitz or, or this positive psychologist from the random corner of the internet. You know, if you consume crushing amounts of content, you will inevitably find something that speaks to you. Um, the goal is just to continue to find people who do. Uh, and I think that podcasts like mine, hopefully, uh, and like Rogan's as well, who are consistently putting out high volumes, high quality guests that are always talking about this, 
it's like going into an art gallery. Like you don't necessarily go to the art gallery because you think that the curator is an unbelievable artist and a specialist in art. You go to an art gallery because you have faith that that curator is going to give you 20, 50, 100 different pieces that speak to you. And maybe not all of them will speak to you, but some of them you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that this thing even exists. Um, and the more that you can find things like that or a good blog, you know, like FS.blog or Seth Godin's stuff, you know, the more that you can expose yourself to people who curate content toward you, the better I think you're going to, uh, you're going to have as outcomes. Do you classify podcasts in the same category as maybe social media, like following someone on Instagram, for example, because I know that it could really get out of hand really quickly. And I saw that you just posted, a. Uh, an Instagram story that you want to keep your phone time in less than an hour. So you're telling me that we should go look for content creators that we admire, that we think are putting out valuable content with valuable guests. But at the same time, we have to watch out for falling into social media just to get that little dopamine spike. And that could be dangerous also. I, I think that my phone use is the biggest impediment to my growth. I just recently finished my end of year review and it's the largest time sink that doesn't contribute to my higher order goals. So my goal this year is to stop it. Now, me listening to podcasts isn't predicated on me having my phone out. The beauty of AirPods and being able to use Siri is that you can just tell it to do whatever you want. Or you can go on for like, what is it, 10 seconds, 20 seconds to load a podcast and press it. Um YouTube as well. I'm like a big fan of watching stuff on YouTube. I will do when I sit down and have food, but I'll do it on my laptop. I just find phone use is a whole other rabbit hole, but it's one that I've thought about an awful lot and I talk about it a lot. As far as I'm concerned, the less time you spend on your phone, the higher your quality of life. You can do everything you need to do off your phone. Instagram DMs can be done on Instagram.com, uh, web.whatsapp.com for WhatsApp or iMessage or messenger.com for Facebook. Like you just don't need your phone out. And for me, it doesn't make me feel good when I use it. But yes, the more that you can consume content that's good, of good quality, that speaks to you and that you enjoy, the quicker your progress is going to be. Now there's a, a top end on this. If you listen to eight hours of podcasts today, you wouldn't be able to remember what happened in hour one, in hour nine. Um, but I spent a lot of time running club nights between 2015 and 2019 in Manchester, which is about two and a half hour drive from me. So once a week, I'd be doing two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back. And all I'd be doing in that time is focusing on podcasts and content. Um, and then when I'm going to the gym, driving to the gym or whatever it might be, like over time you build that up and you're like, well, I'm, I'm talking 250 to 500 hours of YouTube and podcast and audio content just in the car. So, you know, you, you can make good progress quite quickly, but yes, avoid phone use, increase consumption. How do you dissect the, the information that you do listen to in podcasts or in books? Do you do like a recap afterwards and uh, have like a Google Docs? Is there something specific that you do? So you make sure that you apply this in your life? I'm so unorganized. Man. <laughs> like this is hopefully for the people that are listening who think that I sound like some sort of a sophisticated, well put together human. I'm not <laughs> at all. But like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I I I shit you not. Like it's not I'm this isn't me being um modest. I, I don't have a process. I don't have a, a second brain built on Evernote or Rome research mm. or notion or whatever like i know it's cool and everyone's got one at the moment and they're all the book summary that they do and the top five quotes and oh i'll use anki to do spaced repetition so i never forget it <laughs> and then there's a there's a concept that tim ferris has got which is called the good shit sticks mm. and for me that's very much the way that i go about listening to my content there will be a lot more slippage in there there will certainly be things that i will have read and listened to which i've forgotten that i wish i hadn't but it takes a little bit of the pressure off. Um, if you're constantly reading and listening to things with an outcome goal of I have to remember almost everything that I listen to, every single second that's being spoken, I'm going to go to my notes and write it down. And you end up with just this huge index. And you're like, okay, what are you going to do with that? You would be much better off just taking 
the one thing from every book or the one thing from every podcast that resonates with you, or even the one thing from every five podcasts that resonates with you and actually thinking, yes, that's awesome. That, that really stick, the good shit sticks. That was so good. I don't need to write it down. Like all of the stuff that I genuinely care about that has changed my life. I didn't write down until I started thinking about it. So it's not like I had this big document I went back to. It's this thing kept coming up in my mind. And I was like, right, I need to write this down because it's obviously important to me. Um, if you are the sort of person who's analytical and, and organized, which I'm not, um, then great. Like use your notion template and fill it out and do whatever. But for me personally, I just let the content speak to me and I listen to everything, man. Like I've been really into existential risk and the, um, alignment problem for artificial general intelligence and the different ways that we can destroy ourselves. I've been really into that, but some of that stuff's informed the way that I think about the world as well and about myself. So I'm like, right, okay, well, th there's one thing from this book about like s super intelligent robots that I can decide to apply. You know, there's, there's all sorts of different ways that you can go about it. And once you do have that one thing you want to apply, how do you go about applying it in your life? Because I personally tried applying way too many things. And whenever you want to add just this tiny one thing, like I have this right here, I have this habit list and I could only get three oh habits God. per day out of five that I want to do. And they're yeah. always alternating because mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to apply something new. H how do you go yeah. about doing that? This is one of the most uncomfortable things that I had to learn. And I only really properly learned this last year. You are a finite creature surrounded by infinite complexity. Like you are wholly underprepared and under armored to be able to do the things that you want to do. And as someone who has a growth mindset and wants a lot out of the world and looks up to people who are admirable and, and, and seem to get a lot done. You know, you look at Jocko Willink or David Goggins and you think, what would he say? Like he'd just say like, <laughs> stay hard and like carry a boat and do all of your habits. But the reality is that most of us aren't David Goggins. And although that's amazing as motivation, it's not necessarily the way that habits work. So picking the smallest number of things that have the largest impact is the best strategy that I've found. Essentialism by Greg McEwen is a book that I recommend everybody read on as a part of the beginning of their self-development journey. And the reason is it's a, it's a antidote to so much bad thinking around self-development that I had as a part of my journey as well, that the same as you, I get exposed to all of these amazing ideas. And I think, well, great, if I apply them all, my life will be brilliant. And you go, right, yes, it, it might be, but you can't do that. So Take the 10 things you want to achieve. Or sorry, the 10 things that you want to add into your life. Cross off the bottom nine and do the top one because the top one will deliver more returns than all of the rest of them put together and it almost ensures your compliance. So it's taken me since, it's taken me five years to build my morning routine up. But now my morning routine has me doing gratitude, daily planning, breath work, meditation, reading and rehabilitation. So like all of the, different movements I need to do to prepare my body for the day. And all of that's done before 9 a.m. But I didn't start doing that five years ago. Like I've just added a thing in at a time really, really, really slowly. Um, and every time that I push it too far, I get dissatisfied at myself and I feel guilty. And I'm like, oh, you suck. Like, why can't you do, th like you should just be able to fit it all in. The same as you, you're like, oh, there's five, but I seem to only be able to get three. And then the, the gap between the three and the five, that two makes me feel bad, which actually makes me demotivated as opposed to going, right, it's important for me to feel like I'm doing well. Like that positive feedback mechanism where you go, yeah, I crushed today. I did a thing. I said I was going to do a thing and I did a thing. So many people have a lack of confidence in their own ability because they keep on setting their sights ridiculously high. Now, I'm not advocating for people allowing themselves to be mediocre. I'm saying that you will get extraordinary outcomes from consistent inputs as opposed to just going for ridiculous inputs and hoping that the outcomes are going to occur. Like, I, I thought about this a little while ago that consistency is far rarer than talent or enthusiasm. Like, I know far more people who are talented and or enthusiastic 
than are consistent. So what does that tell you? It tells you that if you want a competitive advantage in life, focus on consistency ahead of talent and motivation. Like my podcast, we're 270 episodes in or something like that. I think that I'm good at what I do and I find good guests and I have good conversations with them. But the main thing is that there's no one else that publishes three episodes a week, every single week, whether they've ruptured an Achilles, whether there's a global pandemic on, like no one else in the UK does that. And the only people that do are backed by huge publishing houses. It's an independent team of me and a buddy. So if I can out-compete everyone on consistency, the talent and the enthusiasm will come. But someone can be out there who's 10 times as talented as me at a podcast, but if they're only one-tenth as consistent, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, working on consistency, allowing yourself to feel good about the things that you do, and just picking picking the small smallest number of actions to have the largest amount of impact is a way that will always mean you get the satisfaction, you're not overwhelmed with tasks, you actually get to enjoy your habit. Like it's an antidote as well to just not looking forward to your day. Like when you're like, oh, it's 6 p.m. and I've still got my half hour of meditation to do. It's like well, the meditation's supposed to be making me feel good, not be like a burden to me. So, okay, why don't I just do five minutes? Well, I feel good about five minutes. Yeah, I will. Okay. And then over time, you'll think, oh, well, maybe I can do it. Maybe if I do it first thing in the morning, maybe that'll make it a little bit, oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, well, maybe if I prepare my food the night before, oh, yeah, that actually worked. And then I've freed up some time on the morning. Like, it takes time to iterate on this. And my life and your life are not the same. So I can't say you should do everything on a morning. I think the power of a morning routine is very important, but it's not a one size fits all. And sadly, this is where the self-experimentation comes in and why there really is an upper bound on how quickly you can achieve personal development. And I like that you said really seeing how these habits are making you feel because just because they work for Chris doesn't mean that they work for you or they work for me. So having sort of that intuitive feel of how is this really making me feel and is it adding value to my life? Couldn't agree more. So you mentioned that there's this one that could be more productive, more productive or more efficient than the other nine. What was that one for you in the beginning, that one thing that you really started to implement in your self-development journey? That's a good question. Um, my background as a club promoter meant I had a very inconsistent sleeping pattern and trying to build a consistent sleep and wake pattern or a set of rules around when I went to bed and when I got up. Um, even if there were rules about when I went to work, so I finished at three in the morning and I've needed to cash the till and, and it's 4am and I get home. Okay. What time should I wake up tomorrow? Okay. Let's get up at half 12 and we'll do this and we'll do that. Okay. What if I'm not working? When should I aim to get up? Like just having that for me. So having a stable sleep and wake pattern was probably the most powerful thing, um, that I did in the first place because it facilitated everything else, right? Your body likes going to bed and waking up at the same time. Some of us, people in my industry, uh, nurses, doctors that work in A&E, uh, shift workers, engineers, roadside workers, cleaners, people who do inconsistent sleeping patterns, that gets built in, right? As best you can, try and make it consistent. So that was the first thing. Um, next thing, I went sober. Uh, I've never had a problem with substances. I've never been dependent on alcohol, but I realized that I got more time, more money, more energy, more calories, and more consistency if I didn't drink. So I decided to do that. And I think pretty much everyone in the 21st century, their problems stem from having too much or not enough of energy, consistency, calories, time, and money. So that, that, that fixed a lot of problems for me. And then probably gratitude journaling was, was a big part. I don't do it so much now. Um, I've literally just cycled off doing that and, and now going onto a focused day planner. Um, but that made a big difference because I wasn't for a long time. I'd struggled I, I, for a long time. I wasn't doing anything that I was super proud of because I was playing this persona. And then even when I stopped doing that, I was so frustrated going up against the same challenges that you've mentioned. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? I, I should be 
Jocko Willink in the David Goggins <laughs> boat, like you know, like because it, it, gratitude was a an answer to a lot of the bad thought processes I had going on there, um, and it made me think, okay, I can be like genuinely just happy, like yeah, you did good yesterday. That was like you you made a really good podcast, or you were nice to your mum, or you thought about a friend in a different way, or you did you were the bigger man and decided to de-escalate a, an argument or whatever it might be. Like actually being kind to yourself was a big change, but you start to see how these, there's a web, right? There's a network of different habits that all piece together. If it wasn't for the fact that I was getting up at a good time, I wouldn't have been able to think about my gratitude journaling. And if I was drinking a lot, then I would have been hung over, which would have thrown my consistency, energy, time, money, and calories off. And then if I wasn't doing my gratitude work, then perhaps when it came to meditate, I would have had more bad thoughts that would have been coming up, which would have made my meditation more difficult. You know, it all pieces together. And what we want is the end result. We want, right, I want to be able to have all of that sorted, but you need to work through so much shit to just get yourself to one of those being effectively locked in and it is much, much, much better if you just spend 2021 building in one habit that you'll keep with you for the rest of your life, that is far better than trying to build 10 and none of them coming off. The Kaizian method. And I've been trying to implement Sober January. I already failed once, by the way. <laughs> 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 because it's really hard. I'm Venezuelan and my culture, really everything revolves around drinking. So mm -hmm. whenever you are trying to be sober for a while or you just don't want to drink, I feel like you have to give an essay of reasons as to why you just don't want to drink. And mm. that's something that I feel shared across the board. So what did you do in order to stay true to the commitment of being sober, even though every time you go out, oh, this beautiful girl, oh, come on, take a shot with me, whatever. Mm -hmm. what, what, mm -hmm. what did you do in that, in those situations? Good question, man. I think social pressure is probably one of the main reasons why people don't decide to go sober. Mm. The way that I framed it and the way that I think it's easiest for guys to frame it as well, although it may be for girls, again, don't have a vagina, can't comment, but it, <laughs> it may work. Um, the way that I made it easier for me is when people said, do you want to drink? And I said, no. They said, oh, why? I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing if I'm challenging myself. I'm going to see if I can go for six months without drinking. And they go like, no way. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to see if I can do it. Well, why are you doing that? Oh. And then I'd just say, I'd say what it was. I wouldn't try and give them what I thought they wanted to hear. Because what's the point in that? Like, I'm here to tell my truth, not what they they expect my truth to be right remember the mental models like naval has this quote where he says you know that th that song that you've got stuck in your head for me it was logan paul's 2020 yesterday quite weirdly <laughs> um that song that you've got that's stuck in your head all your thoughts work like that be careful what you think regularly so if you continue to tell people what you think is the palatable reason for you doing anything going out, not going out, sleeping with a girl, not sleeping with a girl, going to the gym, waking up late, doing any behavior, very quickly, like it, you can tell other people such convincing lies that you start to believe them as well. And that's dangerous, <laughs> man. I'm co that's coming from someone who did it for a very, very, very long time. Mm. Um, I would say I'm challenging myself. Why are you doing that? My reason was I want more time, money, and calories to spend on things that I care about. I want to start this podcast thing I'm talking about. So like, I can't be hung over because... I'm wasting between one fourteenth and one tenth of my life drinking and being hungover. If I was to add that back in, imagine all the stuff I could do. Plus you get extra consistency, plus your thinking becomes better and it compounds over time. So it's not just the one time change. It's that each time you don't do it, you get better than you would have been at this uh, and square it. Right. So it just gets exponentially better. Um, that being said, I reintroduced drinking and I'm not a for life sober person. Personally, I believe that anyone who thinks alcohol has no place in society hasn't had a good night out and then <laughs> they should con they should contact me for guest list. Um, but I also don't think that alcohol is necessarily aligned with optimal personal growth, especially when you're young, that little breaks deprogram, see what it's like to go for six months without alcohol. Like there's people, there are people on this planet who will, from the day that they were 
16, until the day they die, not go for more than 14 days without drinking a drug. Which blows my mind that people don't ever decide to question that social norm. What, what could life be? Well, you just don't know what life could be. Maybe it's shit. Maybe being sober sucks, but at least you know now. And I think that if you're a curious person who wants to find out things, utilizing that, going, oh, well, I wonder what life could be like if I went sober. I wonder what life could be like if I moved to Italy or if I decided that I was going to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu or try and date four girls at once. Like whatever it is that you try and do, like the outcomes will be interesting. And yeah, framing it as a challenge and giving yourself an end date are two of the most powerful things. Reason being, when you come up against difficulties with your sobriety, you will feel like, okay, this is why I'm here. I'm not here because it's easy. I'm here because I want the growth and the discomfort is a feature, not a bug. The reason that you have an end date is that there is some fairly robust evidence that shows our yearning or our craving for things is directly proportional to how long it is until our next hit of that thing and not how long it's been since our last hit. So there's a famous study that was done on people that smoke, both flights leaving from Dubai, one going to Paris, one going to New York. So one's about six hours, one's about 10. And they rated the relative cravings of the air hostesses that were on the flight. Lo and behold, the air hostesses on the shorter flight reported cravings occurring sooner than the ones going to New York. Even though the ones going to New York were on a longer flight, at the same time, their cravings were significantly lower. So if you give yourself a deadline that you're working toward, 28 days, three months, six months, however long it might be, you know, okay, that's the end, that's the end goal. The difference between running a marathon and me saying, just run until it hurts a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like we work, we're teleological beings. We work towards end goals. Um, so yeah, those are my two things. Turn it into a challenge. Give yourself a, an end date. I feel like this could be useful not only for like stopping to drink, but for a lot of things. Having that predisposition that, oh, I'm going to do this for a month or I'm going to do this for two weeks already puts you in that mindset of this is what I have to do. As you said with the example, the people thought they were going to be there sooner. Therefore, they had the cravings. If you just think there's going to be a certain amount of time, maybe the cravings and uh, the thing that you're trying to avoid would uh, be a bit easier to withstand. And Chris, um, we're talking about this web uh, of self-development. You adding one thing and it's a lot easier adding another thing. If you have meditation, it's a lot easier to add the gratitude journal or whatever you might think it's useful reading. So before starting this uh, web of self-development, what would you say is the most useful innate technique that we already all carry? That's another good question. Um, the sleep pattern's a big one because it forms the foundation for everything else. And actually prioritizing sleep as well, making sure that you do get between seven and eight hours. It doesn't matter how much you think you can tolerate low sleep. The likelihood of you having the gene mutation that permits you to function at less than seven hours sleep is the same likelihood as you being hit by lightning twice. So <laughs> you, you almost definitely don't have it, right? Um, so focusing on sleep has been a big red pill that everybody can do. It's free. Like it's the most free thing that you can <laughs> that you can do and you can start it tonight. Um, Joe Rogan episode number 1109 with Matthew Walker was the turning point for me. And I know it was for a lot of other people as well listening to that. So that would be certainly something I think everyone can focus on. Just get your, get your sleep sorted. So many people think that they're uncreative or ratty or nervous or anxious or depressed or manic or anything. And they don't realize that it's just that they're underslept, but they've been underslept for so long that that sensation has now become a part of their personality. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to promote specifically? 
No, man. Uh, if you like the sound of my voice, then you can listen to it far less on my show, uh, Modern <laughs> Wisdom, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen. YouTube, Modern Wisdom, and Instagram, Twitter, etc. at Chris Will X. If you want a free life hacks list with 200 ways that you can upgrade your life for free, chriswillx.com slash life hacks. It's a free ebook that I made that compiles everything that we've done on the podcast around how to make a good toasted sandwich or why you should buy a dog in an automatic car. There's a lot of different things in there. So yeah, that's chriswillx.com slash lifehacks and modern wisdom for everything else.